Welcome to Reader Syndicate 3.0, the next evolution of the look into counterculture that is canon. My name is Matthew, owner of Riot Seeds, and this started as a one-man mission for strain history and breeding science. Over time, it's evolved into something bigger, better, and more of a team effort. We will be joined by members of the Can Illuminati and other friends throughout the seasons to hear their takes on grow techniques, breeding science, strain history, and more. Our mission is to combat the narrative that corporate cannabis and seed posers are obfuscating for their own financial benefit. Welcome to the underground. We are the Syndicate. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Breeders Syndicate. I am your host, Thousandfold. Sadly, today we were meant to have Matt, but something came up last minute for him. So we will be running the show without Matt. Um, as a, I don't know, as an aside, I, I, I can only imagine that he, he's not too disappointed to miss growing roundtables. He, he's, he's expressed his indifference before, uh, but it's always fun to have him, obviously. So it's sad that we don't get him tonight. But that is okay. We hope he is doing okay. Um, today we welcome back Screwstone Scarecrow and Kyle from the previous Growers Roundtable, um, but for the first time we welcome Bumcat. So this show tonight is actually going to be about organic growing, and I wanted to state a qualifier here, which is that organic growers, maybe somewhat ironically, tend to be some of the most tribal, dogmatic, scary people in the community. So <laughs> we're not here to be you know, the people on this on this panel are not here to be authorities. They're just here as growers, sharing their thoughts, sharing their experience. So unclench your fists, put your knives away, take your hands off the keyboard, and just try to enjoy the show. If your opinions differ, feel free to comment later on. Okay, so maybe since Bumcat is new to the show, uh, I want to invite him to speak on a couple of things. Uh, one thing I'll get him to repeat, because he told us a bit about this before we hit record, is what his recent, you know, what his current growing situation is like. Um, and secondarily, uh, why he wanted to do the show in general. Um, Bumcat, do you want to tell us about what you've been growing? You told us a bit about your situation moving just before. Tell us again. Yeah, so I, um, I just ended up moving up to the Rockies around uh, 9,000 feet. But um, the last two years, I've been growing in an apartment down in the Denver area. Um, I was growing in a two by four, uh, which is a 300 watt light, just really small, um, really confined space to uh, do my stuff. But um, now I have a little bit more space up here. But I did just harvest last May a round of Trinity Bubba Kush um, from Two Dog, and I had a five potential keepers that moved on to the second round. One of them didn't end up cloning, so it's down to four now um, that are gonna get moved on to the second round, but yeah. And then as for the second part, uh, I wanted to do this show mainly because I feel like it's A, because you've said, um, and many others <laughs> will point out that organic growers are really tribal and it's really hard to find a good discussion, in my opinion, where people can actually be fair and not be overly biased to one side. So I kind of wanted to have this conversation more just on the grounds of being able to actually talk about these ideas and share these ideas with others, because I feel like growing organically is kind of pitfalled and there's a lot of hard like ways to find information. I feel like we, between the three of us, can really guide some people and help um, provide some information and helpful tips. Yeah, absolutely. And um, thank you so much as well for, you know, initiating all of this. I think you spoke to me about this like a year ago. <laughs> yeah, it, was <laughs> a little bit. it took us a little bit to get to this. But um, I think once we, I think once we knew we could get Scroost and, and Kyle as well, I kind of forgot um, that we, we had more people. I know that we have more organic growers, by the way. It just took me a little bit to kind of like think of who, who might fit. So yeah, I appreciate all of you being here again. Uh, maybe Bumcat, last question for you is how long have you been growing and how long have you been growing organically for? Um, so I have a little bit of a mixed career. Uh, I started in organics and I've grown everything at home. It's been organics, but the last two years, I've had, um, almost two years, uh, it'll be two in September, but I've worked for um, an MSO here in Colorado. Uh, I'll keep the company name 
uh, for later for you guys. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I've actually really enjoyed it. And um, I kind of call it, it's weird. I call it a, a mom and pop MSO because the owner is like an old forum head who ended up getting some funding from some friends. And it was, he's a really good guy and really loves and like has a passion for genetics. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun for me to be able to like bounce ideas off him. And he's been growing for 30 something years, but I personally have been growing since 2019. I don't really like to count that first year because it was so, so horrible. Uh, we can get to that one later. Um, but uh, everything that I've done, which were the first two years were outdoor. And then I bought a tent and really fucked that first round up as well. And then as well, and then I've just kind of slowly learned everything I could from resources, from build a soil YouTube channel to Jeff Lowenfels teaming with series and um, all sorts of other podcasts uh, that I can go on and on about it later. Uh, but yeah, that's yeah. kind of where I've been at. Awesome, man. Thank you. Um, Kyle and Skruston, uh, maybe start with Kyle. Uh, obviously, you guys have been on the show before, but again, just as an icebreaker, warm up. Maybe tell us again about uh, what you've been growing recently and your your setup and style. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for having me again. <clears throat> um, I do uh, you know TLO. Uh, you know, mostly it's the Rev. Uh, basically, uh, it's kind of all his stuff. Uh, it's you know TLO. It's everybody thinks it's like a kind of you know it's one one thing, but it's kind of there. You can do different kind of kind of styles within that. So you know, I just kind of do that, and I've kind of mix it around just based on what's going on at the time um since i'm going in the garage my uh, environment changes so i just kind of i'm always kind of doing different stuff uh right now i have uh see i got some santa cruz rec uh some uh, blue dream s1s uh, let's see what else do i have in there uh, i think that's oh i got some this is a black poison from the rev growing in there and that's pretty much it. I'm just trying to doing uh, some reversal stuff. Uh, I'm just kind of playing around doing a whole bunch of different things, actually. So, yeah. Um, Very nice. That's really it. No, not too much from the last episode, really. I'm just saying same old, same old. I just keep it chugging along. <laughs> I think one question I had for you was um, how much how much experience do you have with synthetics? Uh, well, I only know from seeing other grows. And that's mostly from my family uh, in Mendo, and they did uh, a lot of uh, depth and outdoor. So mostly it was mostly a synganic type of thing. They basically would pick up yeah. whatever was at the grow shop because they were doing it so long. You know, it was type of the grow shops would, hey, we have this, we have that, and they would throw it out there. And so basically, I know from that, and they've always grown really good stuff. But obviously, I found out later on, you know, when you do that outside, it doesn't really affect stuff because of the decomposition of uh, so it doesn't really matter what you put because the decomposition uh it just kind of gets rid of anything that's bad because it's outside so the microbes and stuff are eating away and it so it doesn't really matter what you put outside type of thing so it's not really synganic uh if you I, if, it's kind of hard to explain i guess um but uh yeah that's the only thing i don't i've never did synganic anything so yeah no, that's cool. And I'm sure we can get into some of the details later on. Um, Skruston, tell us a bit about what you've been growing recently and your experience with organic, your setup, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Um, so I just recently harvested uh, Skyline from H&L and I harvested a Peaberry and a Bubbleberry V2 from Matt. Um, and in my other flowering space, I have garbage cloud from uh, from Pack going right now. Um, my setup is, I mean, it's pretty simple. I have one uh, four by four for my veg, and in that, I have uh, one of those chrome racks. Um, so I have like three layers to be able to move plants through it. Um, and then I have two two by fours for flowering and one three by three for drying. Simple, small space, uh, but I'm still able to go through quite a bit of numbers just um, by keeping things like small. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of like the synthetic organic, 
thing, you know, in your experience, how much have you, how much time have you spent with either approach? Uh, so I, when I first started trying to grow, I was doing just like, you know, soil that I was stealing from around town and shit. Um, and, but like, I never harvested anything or, you know, like it, other than some wispy bracks and stuff. Um, and then when I started like actually, you know, buckling down, uh, when I got back, uh, back home in 2011, I went to hydro, uh, just cause, you know, I, I got a, uh, Ed Rosenthal book and was like, fuck it. I want to try flood tables, I guess. And that's when like, I actually started cropping. Um, and I did that for till 2015, early 2016. And I had to take a little bit of a break um, for a couple years. And when I came back, I, I wanted to, I wanted to try out organic. So I've been doing, doing the whole like quote unquote living soil stuff um, for the past four years now. And yeah, I don't know. I mean, I grow, I, I want to preface all of this whole episode by like, I don't think that any one style has supremacy in terms of like smoke and all of that. Um, it's more so however you grow best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I am not a good hydro grower, but I am a good organic grower. That's the only reason I do it. It's not because of some weird dogma or anything like that. Yeah. 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 Many of us, I think, just grow relative to, I don't know, arbitrary arbitrary constraints in our lives right like the the space that you have the the products you have access to at the time like you know there are lots of like <laughs> arbitrary reasons why we grow the way we do um and i think like i was saying to you guys before we started recording i think really the value in hearing from different people is is hearing about the different conditions that they grow under and why things may or may not work under those conditions uh, rather than just trying to state like, you know, silver bullets, uh, like, oh yeah, this is just good. Like an abstraction of anything that's never true, right. With growing, we know that. So I think this is just a broad invitation to, to all three of you to, you know, think about your experience, think about why things may or may not have worked and for what reason. Um, and I think talking about, uh, tech, tech and strategy in that way is, uh, a little bit more, um, generous right because we're not just saying oh we just we do this because it's good or we do this because it's the best because that that's never that's never really true in isolation of you know everything else um with that qualifier i might bring it back to bumcat um well one thing i, I guess now we're, we're kind of getting into the 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 actual meat of the conversation and there's a point here about you know how one might try to define organic growing and there was another phrase that you used, Bumcat, that I was kind of intrigued by, which is uh, the great compromise. So maybe do you want to kick us off with some of that? Like, what are your thoughts around, you know, what what is organic growing and why do you think of it as a great compromise? All right, uh, let's get into the meat of it. This is going to be fun. So um, first, I'm going to kind of define at least from everything that I've read and my anecdotal experience, the kind of key differences between salt and organic, just on a very simple level, there's a lot more depth that we can go into this and later or another time. But um, salt is essentially the most basic form of mineral that a plant can absorb if it's held in the right sus uh, suspension for it. And organics is creating and utilizing like a relationship, a symbiotic relationship with um, fungal networks and microbial networks within your actual media um, to facilitate an exchange of sugars from the root zone in the plant. Uh, with those microbes, it'll exchange those nutrients. Um, the great compromise is a very, <laughs> growing organically indoors is kind of ironic in a lot of ways. Um, it's an artificial light source uh, you're using uh, more often than not a uh, potting soil that's coming out of a bag that's being mixed by somebody at a facility and not using traditional amended earth, although that is a possibility if you have the space and are willing to commit to it. 
Um, but the great compromise really centers around what an indoor grower has or indoor organic grower has to do when they're growing because you are never going to actually follow nature 100 percent when you're adding in artificial things so in my instance i was growing in an apartment in a two by four for the last two years and i i wanted to run through plants i wanted to see as many different phenos as of many different plaques that i could see so i spent the last two years just really going at it and i never grew the same plant twice um it really taught me a lot and it forced me into growing smaller sized plants in that space and using one gallon pots, which ironically goes against a lot of living soil kind of principles and ideas <laughs> with the small pots. Um, I know I'm going to get attacked for that one. It's not living soil, but I made it work. It's very much possible. Um, if you just really pack, you know what if you know what you're using and you understand the system fundamentally, you can appropriately size your plants prior to flower with the right amount of veg time and you can make the system work. Um, you can use things like enzymes, you can use uh, all sorts of ferments, uh, different things like that to, that it can aid and catalyze different processes within your media to really get the full use out of it. Um, but I've tried growing in 20 gallon pots in a two by four and you can only fit two of them in there and it gets really crowded really fast. So I was forced into a much smaller compromise with smaller one gallon pots in my space, but largely the compromise is an individual compromise for every indoor organic grower who's trying to find or trying to follow a general print, the general organic system of growing cannabis. So, uh, Bum, I have a question. Yeah, what's up? Mm -hmm. So, what what are you doing uh, for nutrition? Are you using like fish hydrolysate um, to to feed them, or are you just top dressing a bunch? What what do you? Because one one gallon is small. So, how do you uh, compensate for that? Uh, yeah, I was using a lot of things like fish hydrolysate and. Uh oh, <laughs> happened again. All righty. Okay. So, yeah, I was using a lot of things like fish hydrolysate and top dressing a lot. Um, I was also using things like uh, Build a Soil's Big Six Micros. Um, I'm going to name drop a handful of companies. I am by no way sponsored in any shape. Um, this podcast is not sponsored <laughs> in any shape. We don't get paid no, for this. Um, <laughs> we would love a check, though. So, come on. Let's get it. But um, yeah, I was using a lot of things like that and top dressing. Uh, I'm a big fan of cl uh, Clackamas Coot, actually. Um, I've uh, a lot of the build a soil ideology, which is a lot of things that taught me, like kind of the fundamental living soil system principles um, are derived directly from a lot of the things that he was talking about on the forums back in the day. So uh, he's really big on things like vermicompost, which are just essentially worm castings um and other things like uh, sprouted seed teas i don't really brew teas just because it was really difficult and they absolutely stink in apartments um and that's kind of really inconvenient for when you're actually growing in a confined space where you're not allowed to do that um but more or less i was the way i was growing i was doing like a week-long veg i would go straight from clone into a one gallon pot of build a soil soil just any run of the mill um, and essentially when I would mix the actual pot and when I was transplanting I would add probably about one third of it as worm castings and then I'd take some lava rock which are just essentially really porous and add aeration and add about a third of those in and then I would just grab about two pinches worth just I'm more of a kind of just dump and you'll see kind of cook at the end but uh, I don't really use a lot of measurements. We'll, we'll get into this later when we talk about pH. That's going to be a fun one too. But um, yeah, I was taking things like Kashi Blend, which is a fermented grain product that is really rich in things like nitrogen. And I was using other things like that to kind of catalyze my process and allow... I'm, I kind of followed a really intense dryback push for the first couple weeks of flower, and that would really allow my roots to get established within that media 
And between, depending on what I was growing and the length of flowering time, I would top dress sometime between day 14 and 28. Um, if things are going like 11, 10, 11 plus weeks, I, the longest thing I have anything I've grown is 13 weeks. Um, I would do something like closer to 28 days. If I'm doing something shorter, like a eight to nine weeker, I'm going to do something more along the lines of day 14 because I don't want a large amount of nitrogen going into the later flowering period. I would rather have the plant try to pull as much of it possible um, in the beginning. So when it's actually using that in the earlier stages of flower, rather than getting an over nitrogen um, fed plant at towards the end of flower. But uh, yeah, I would kind of also, I remember KT talking about pulse feedings being a thing from TLO. I have anecdotal experience of that working really, really well for me. I would do something like on day 21. Um, yeah, about day 21, I would do a really in high dose of like, I want to say it's two teaspoons per gallon of, of fish hydrolysate and like a, a dose and a half of what's recommended for the um, micronutrients from the big six. And I would r just really hit them hard for that day. And then that can would usually last me about two days. So it would be like day 21 and 22. I'd get a really intense feeding. And then I would literally just be water only with a handful of like really small added um, additives like uh, Kuyaha extract um, or like a horticultural coconut oil um, or a freeze dried aloe vera powder, um, anything like that that's rich in saponids that will help aid with like minor terpene production and stuff like that. Although that's kind of based on theory, I've seen anecdotal evidence in my own grows of it helping. Uh, nice. Um, Kyle, do you, you also grow in relatively small containers, right? You, are we saying? Um, what are your, yeah. any comments on this? Uh, yes, I will. I, right now I'm doing one gallons and I started out in twos and threes, but uh, I wanted to look through more plants and I've slowly adapted to where um, I'm able to do one gallons with the, with the TLO. Uh, since everything's pretty, it runs pretty hot in TLO, uh, I'm able to do the one gallons because there's enough food in there to where I've only done water before. You're not going to get yield, but that's not what my uh, importance is I don't care about yield I care about just good smoke for myself um, uh, yeah I don't there's not really a whole lot I do I've done all kinds of different stuff because like I said within TLO there's different stuff you can do uh, there's a micro pond uh, strategy you can use um, which is like uh, after watering you can add uh, stuff on top say like alfalfa meal you can add that up until about you know the about halfway through so say about day 28 you know you could stop something like that uh, it's kind of weird for people because i know they think that will cause a lot of herms i know that's a big thing with the tricantinol i believe that's how you say it i'm not exactly sure uh because i always have to read i i never hear people read uh uh say words i always have to read it myself so i'm not sure what that is but i know that's a big thing with alfalfa meal uh, people think um and there's just other stuff i've done top dressings and all that uh spikes there's all the different kinds of stuff you can do uh and i just kind of utilize depending on what's going to happen in the future depending so if right now i'm running really really super hot so i wanted to get, make sure i have a lot of food so this time i did spikes and i'm doing um uh the churn it's a little bit of micro pond uh just doing different kind of stuff because uh everything's just everything's messed up right now so because there's nothing's nothing's uh going right you know i'm all every day switching so especially in the california heat yeah very nice thank you yeah. um bumcat did you have any prompts for kyle or scruston based on what you were saying any questions for them in turn um not off the top of my head i'll let you know if i do though uh what did you want to move on to next all right, I have a fun one. Uh, we're going to go back to the first round table of you, Spindle, Urn, and Local. Um, we're going to touch Holy. on the, Yeah, we're going to go back. Uh, we're going to touch on the higher floor and higher ceiling than salt um, topic. Oh. I really will. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're going back to it. I wanted to talk about this. Okay, okay. Um, Do you want to say really clearly what, what was said? Uh, yes. What, what, what was said in the episode? So the conversation that you guys had really centered around the concept of organics in general, having essentially a higher ceiling and a higher floor than salts. Um, 
I really have mixed feelings about that statement kind of as a whole. I feel it's a slight misnomer um, because I feel like the level of entry to find really good knowledge can be quite difficult it, for a new person. Um, I would have, sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, I would have thought it would maybe higher ceiling, lower floor. Yeah, right? I would, like that's, more risk. that's definitely what I would have said. Cause I've myself have grown some absolutely horrendous organics. Um, I, I've seen it myself. Like I've been there. So I, I wanted to get KT's and Scruston's opinion on this. Um, but I essentially, for me, I feel like once you understand the basic concepts of like how these systems work and how you're kind of utilizing the general relationships of microbes and, fu and fungus within that root system, it's pretty easy to manipulate. But I feel like getting to that point like takes a little bit of more dedication and like actual time, like researching and understanding general concepts within organics. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to get the other two's opinion on that because I feel personally, um, mm -hmm. a lot of organic growers are so tribal. They will not, they're not willing to admit that you can grow bad weed organically, but I know from firsthand experience, it's very possible to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's, that's a good one. Yeah. Uh, maybe go back to Scruston, uh, before Kyle and Scruston, what's your experience in terms of like the best and the worst, you know, like, uh, I, how hard I, was it to get going? You know? Yeah. Uh, so I definitely agree with that. You know, you can grow bad organic weed. I promise you. Um, it's not very hard. Uh, but the top end, um, that I'm a little iffy on because I've had really, really good, um, like pure salt run stuff. Um, maybe like shelf life. I, I've definitely noticed that, um, like even I, you know, my friend group down here, uh, some of them do grow both ways and there seems to be, uh, a longevity, um, like bonus on their, on their organic stuff. It just, the quality seems to stay a little bit longer with it. And I don't, I don't know why, <laughs> um, I don't know if it's because it's just more well-rounded, like while growing or what. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of really bad information about organics. Um, and I don't, it's, I don't know. It's hard enough as someone new coming in, even when you get, you know, good information, it's hard enough to mm -hmm. start kind of actually applying it correctly and stuff. <laughs> um, it, but there's like, there's a lot of real, you know, you could always just go off of the bottles. Hey, I'm going to get A and B and this dude told me to get, you know, a CalMag supplement and just go by the, the rates that it says on the bottles and you're probably going to do pretty all right, you know? Um, I, I think that's a really good observation though. And I think Bumcat did, a, I mean, all of you have alluded to this in, in some degree or to some degree, the notion that the resources that you have access to and the information itself is kind of like a not a it's a i was going to say it's a problem but like it's you, know, you can bubble. talk about technique but like yeah if you if you can't even get reliable information then you're not you, you know how do you even start properly um kyle what's your experience of the floor quote unquote and ceiling of organic growing uh, oh yeah, well, uh, I only grow really great stuff, obviously. No, 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 obviously. I've, I've, <laughs> grown, I've obviously grown some bad stuff. Obviously, you can. I mean, that, that that's that's kind of silly. Um, uh, everybody has bad grows. I, I don't care who you are. I've seen it. Every, everybody has bad grows. If you, everybody who doesn't is, I think they're they'd be lying to you. Yeah, but a pretty for, bad for, grow for, going right now. Yeah. yeah, I mean, hey, it happens. I mean, yeah, let's see. I always say I always have problems. Uh, it's always I'm always trying to fix something. It happens, you know. Open your tent up, and it's like, oh, great. Here, what 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 I got to fix today? I'm thinking, oh, great, just water. No, nope. it ends up into you know, 45 minutes of something. You know, trying to fix something or you know what happened. Um, trying to figure out, well, hey, why why that happened? You know, why is this color on the leaf now? Why what you know type of thing. Um, yeah, and for, as far as resources, uh, what I found was best to uh, great uh, organic um, resources are older stuff like uh, Rodale's, Rodale's Organic uh, Composting, Rodale's Organic um, Gardening. Those are really great books because they're older, 
and they don't have a lot of that corporate growing type of stuff in um, thrown in there type of thing. So I, I always found the older stuff is always better to go back on, especially the books. But Rodale's I always found are pretty good too, for especially for organic stuff going back for um, for starting out, because it gives you uh, not just it's not just cannabis; it's growing organic all in general, which is great because it gives you the whole spectrum of all plants. And I found that was that really helped me out understand uh, before I even started growing. Uh, I that helped me understand the basics of what was going on, and then eventually, once you get uh, you got to be consistent with it. And then once you get consistent with it, you kind of just fall into your own method. And that's like me, like some of the stuff I do, I just kind of don't even have to measure type of thing. I just kind of know, oh, this is what's happening. And then I fix it. And then, you know, you just kind of get into your own method and then you just kind of know what's going on. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. I should have said this earlier uh, when I introduced this whole episode, but I, I'm not an organic grower. Uh, so maybe one thing I wanted to, and it's probably a bit of a tangent for now, but uh, one thing I wanted to ask for any of you really, but maybe I can direct it at Bumcat to begin with. Are you able to generalize for me what the major differences between the, I guess, popular systems are uh, that you guys have, have discussed? Like, you know, you mentioned, um, what is this, like TLO, <laughs> KNF, like living soil, like are, are there you know are there broad distinctions that you could draw that like might help people understand what these different approaches are? Yeah, so um, these are all kind of systems that have been founded by different people in different areas for different needs overall. Um, living soil, no-till. There's a lot of academics that are like very, very highly educated on soil science and soil biology and like the makeup of soil and all of that. And they, a lot of them are really pushing the living soil no-till type of systems for larger scale ag um, like agriculture to help preserve and feed more people without essentially destroying the environment through commercial agriculture. That's a whole argument in and of itself. Um, TLO, I am not the most familiar with. I'll probably definitely defer to KT on that one. But for KNF and Jadam, they are kind of offshoots of each other. I believe KNF was the original, what KNF stands for Korean Natural Farming, and it's largely centered around being able to farm in a system that is entirely closed looped to anything outside your locale. So you're not using anything commercial whatsoever. Everything that you're using is um essentially fermented and then used within dilution rates or varying dilution rates for different things um there's so many different types of ferments that have offshooted out of that um then there's jadam which i believe I'm, i could be wrong on this one but i believe jadam was written by the author of knf's son who um focused more on less a uh, heavy um food it within the ferments and more focused on like microbial and bacterial growth and uh, using those fungal and bacterial systems within your soil. Um, and then you have like smaller little cannabis based offshoots from those systems. Like I've heard people talk about like Pacific Northwest natural farming. Um, there's all sorts of different kinds of thing, but essentially each one was founded by a, a different group or individual um, that all kind of are slightly off and different from each other they're it's kind of like salt and organics all take like in the broader sense like it's each system is a little bit more applicable and easier for certain individuals like i have a couple buddies who are absolutely phenomenal knf and jadam growers um everything they do is focused around fermenting and harvesting within their locale using all sorts of crazy stuff like horsetail nettle and fermenting those in different types of um sugar solutions with water you can do all sorts of different stuff like that but they are all different systems within the larger category of growing organically with living soil kind of being the most traditional amended earth style of organic growing no thank you that you did really well because like i i you know i kind of just fired that at you on the spot um thank you very much for for that um we can you know, if we return to that, like the floor ceiling conversation, 
Was there anything else you wanted to add on that? I saw that in the outline you had an a- analogy. Skiing, snowboarding, is that is that yours? Yeah, that's me. So um, at least I, don't, I can't speak for everybody on this, but for me, I've done a little bit of both. And I picked up snowboarding really, really easily. And I had a really hard time picking up skiing. Um, but once I picked up skiing, I found it a lot easier to actually do like ski and do that instead of snowboard. And I found it much more difficult to get better at snowboarding than I did at skiing. So for me, I, it's it's like a really clear reference that it's like for some people uh, growing within organics is definitely going to be the better way. It's some, for some people, it just fits their individual system of how they understand to grow plants. Um, and some people have a really hard time with organics and some people have a really good time with organics the same way with salt. Uh, I wanted to reiterate a point. I believe that both KT and Kirsten made earlier that there is no individual way to grow everything universally better it really comes down to the individual and their preferences and their understanding of the systems that they're using and the time spent to actually understand what's going on and how those processes work well said um any comments or questions from kyle or skristen at this point no not that i can think of that's pretty good Nope. Um, I don't know, when you were talking about this uh, skiing, snowboarding thing, it, it kind of brought to mind, like, do you think an implication here is also that if you if you can understand organic growing, um, how would I put it? Do you think it necessitates having a finer understanding of the plant and the, its needs and the, the, the ecosystem and all that? Seems like that's kind of what you're saying. I think it definitely... Yeah, I want to say yes. Um, it's hard to say that with absolute confidence. But for me personally, at least from my observations, it feels that like I'm, at least in my friend group, I'm a little bit more in tune with having to deal with like individuals on an individual level and kind of aid to them. So I feel that, yeah, it kind of forces a, like a more keen eye and like a little bit more centered focus on like each individual as opposed to kind of being able to run a system where in salt you could it's a universal recipe that you slowly adjust over time for those individuals once you've actually understood them um it kind of goes back to the idea of like organics the plant feeds individually within an organic system as it pleases pulling what nutrients it desires out of its soil within that facilitation of exchange of nutrients for sugars in the root zone so in organics it's in the plant actually is doing all the work for you in the root zone all you need to do is give it little things here or there to do like to like essentially as additives Mm -hmm. but that's that's at least my perspective on it i've Uh, heard this Oh, go, Kyle. You go. Oh, I was going to say, well, I think it's more of like a, uh, uh, I guess, uh, I don't know, I, without, without being offensive, it's like a trust thing. So, <laughs> I mean, I mean, no, 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 but you're, you're basically in organics, you're, you're, you're letting, it's in more of a, all, like TLO is like uh, basically all natural. It's, it's as close to mimicking Mother Nature as possible. Uh, so you're, you're trusting that the plant knows what it, what it's what it knows to do for tens of thousands of years compared to say syn- synthetic you're you have to feed it every single day uh and to me that you like you're not having trust in what the plant does type of thing like you you want to have control over everything that you're feeding it and compared to organics you're just having trust that what you put in there the plant's going to know what it what it does type of thing very well said we talked about I don't know, Bunkett, did you want to get into like, you kind of went towards mechanisms like uh, uptake and in the outline, you have a point that's like comparing nutrient uptake between organic and salt. I mean, is that what you you just highlighted essentially? Yeah, more or less. Um, I can kind of go, I can refer back to my outline real quick. Um, But essentially, all right, I want to phrase this correctly. 
Organics mm-hmm. is creating and utilizing the relationship, uh, symbiotic relationship with various fungal and bacterial systems in your media that facilitate that exchange of sugars. And um, that's actually called the rhizophagus. It's a relatively newer scientific discovery. I want to say it was first written about about 20 years ago. Um, uh, you can look more into it, but that essentially is the actual exchange where the actual exchange happens with the bacteria in when you're feeding chelated nutrients to a plant the actual i want to i'm sorry i want to phrase this correctly but the actual um bacteria that are creating that exchange in the root zone start to die off similar to how muscles work this is the uh, the best way i've understood it um when you don't use a muscle over time, it dies off and it atrophies. That's essentially what happens when you're feeding chelated nutrients to a plant's root zone. Um, when you're using an organic system, what's going on is through that rhizofungus, the plant is at forced to exchange sugars for that nutrition. Otherwise, the plant doesn't have the ability to actually uptake the nutrition. It's within that actual symbiotic relationship which is where the exchange of nutrients occurs for the plant to actually feed itself. So, um, yeah, I believe that really highlights the main one. Um, second big difference I've read and seen, um, is that through these relationships with, uh, fungi and bacteria, uh, you can more easily access second, like secondary metabolites, which can, aid in producing a higher quality product that is no guarantee that is what's happening that is my understanding from my reading that i've done on this subject Um, it's a very nuanced and very complex subject with a lot of arguments and a lot of different perspectives on this side Um, but from everything that i've read and gathered this is essentially what's happening in your root system i and i'm not saying that if you're growing in an organic system and you're applying that trust of the plant to act, like do everything that it needs you are it's not there is i'm not saying organics is better overall because of that e- exchange you can still grow absolutely phenomenal product just like screwston said um with salt nutrition i do it at work pretty like every day it, we grow great product it's easy to do um i believe that this is where the echelon of like the high, the highest echelon of highest quality cannabis can come from, but it's not a guarantee in any fa- like any way. Um, it still requires all the effort and the individual attention of the grower to actually get that done within that system. I just believe the system can help you e- more easily access it once you have a better understanding of it as a whole. Very nice. Yeah, I'm I'm very impressed that you can. T- <laughs> I'm I'm trying I'm walking a fine line. I know I'm going to get some DMs about this, but it's I'm everything I'm reading I'm going off of is stuff that I've read online more often than not coming from academic sources. Um I majored in English in college, so I have no issue reading. I will dive hey, head first. Man. Yeah, I will dive head first right into a 60-page paper if I need to understand something just so I can make my life a little bit easier in that actual understanding of the process. Totally, and and I will say this as well, kind of going back to my earlier qualifier, like we're not here to um, distribute theory perfectly. That's not really the point. Yeah, we're here to to kind of talk about our experience and, and opinions on on these things. So yeah, we, we may not get it perfect, but I think people are gonna get the idea at least. Um, okay. Uh, Anything else on on this on the me- on mechanisms, uh, Bumcat? Otherwise, what would you like to talk about next? Um, we can touch on like cation exchange, if you want to get into that, like uh, with cocoa versus like a a traditional potting soil type of thing. I have a rough little paragraph on it. Um, Maybe before, yeah, that sounds good. I mean, before we dump, uh, jump into that. Kyle and Scruston, um, what different kinds of media have you guys used? Uh, well, I've only done the uh, rough stuff. So right now I'm going, I'm doing uh, my recycled uh, soil. And it's been five years 
And so, yeah, I've just been yeah. recycling and reamending. And uh, in the beginning, I did use cocoa as a pH buffer, but uh, we'll obviously we'll get into that there. But that's in there for aeration. Uh, but I don't use that anymore because. Uh, but I could use cocoa because it does decompose. So eventually, you know, uh, that's obviously good for you know what I in in my thing for the decomposition and it's a uh, ph neutral so um yeah that's basically it i've only used uh, the revs uh, re-emitted soil so nice excuse me uh so i i mix my soil up um just like your simple the quote unquote coots mix which is just an augmented cornell mix um and in one of my beds, I used black leaf mold instead of peat moss. And then in the in the other bed, I used your traditional uh, sphagnum peat moss as the base. They both work fine. They both have been working fine for years now. Um, and I just I just use a like a regular, uh, not out of preference, but just because it's what's at my. Uh, at my local hydro store, I get uh, the build a soil 3.0 for my veg stuff since that's actually moving through. Nice, thank you. Yeah, Bumcat, uh, we can talk about cation exchange nutrient uptake soil versus cocoa if you want to kick it off. All right. Um, so Yes, soil has a higher cationic, cation exchange than a media like cocoa, um, but in my opinion, that negates the whole concept of um, the individual plants having a preferred rate of nutrition over the course of veg and flower. Um, there's something to do with a media like cocoa that acts kind of more like a direct inject IV, where everything that you're watering into the, the media itself the plant is immediate if it's in the right suspension it, the plant is free to absorb all of it and there's nothing stopping it whereas in soil because you have that relationship with the microbes and fungus that the plant uses to eat um, it allows the plant to actually dictate which nutrients are uptaken and which nutrients will not um, the roots of a plant grown in a salt system lose that ability to pick and choose which nutrients are being absorbed. If it's in the right suspension, ultimately the plant is going to uptake it as a whole. Um, I feel like a good kind of way to describe this is that uh, salt gives the grower a lot more control to be able to choose what's available when for the plant to eat. Whereas in soil, you're giving that trust in the plant, the actual control to grow and choose what it wants when. Um, I've watched firsthand at work. Um, we use Athena 3.0 recipe. We run that high EC, we're, we're a production facility. Um, and I've watched firsthand at work that like plants will not be happy and will not react happily to a high feed if that's not what they want. Um, a great example of this would be any puck type genetics that I've seen or puck hybrids for that matter that I've seen. They are not particular fans whatsoever of any high nutrition. Um, I did a little anecdotal experiment for myself. Um, my boss was kind enough to let me take one of those home that didn't make the cut. And I was curious and I ran one of them just in the tent just to see like, I wonder if this plant will grow a little bit better if it's just not getting pushed as hard by being forced fed things that it doesn't necessarily want at this time. Um, the plant will, <laughs> the plant at work was about two feet tall, little like individual bracts stacked right on top of each other. And at home when I, in a one gallon pot with a really heavy top dress on like, I think it was day 17, um, it turned out phenomenal and it grew to about a three and a half, four foot plant in a one gallon pot. Um, smoked great, looked way better, smell was way more pungent. Um, this is just kind of more of my anecdotal experience of like actually seeing that plants don't always like being force fed certain things at certain times. Um, mm. I know local prior in one of the round tables has kind of brought up that uh, in like Jack's, 
there's, I believe it's um, nitrogen is tied to calcium. And so it has like, he has, as he said, he's voiced that before he's had a hard time with uh, certain plants, not just not wanting that much uh, nitrogen, but he, they need a little bit more calcium at the time. So those, those two being tied kind of can cause some problems. Um, but this is just from my general experience and things that I've been listening to. Yeah, Kyle and Skristen, any 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 like anecdotes from your own experience on this topic? Uh, well, from my understanding, when you feed, uh, well, at least liquid synthetics, the way I understand it is, but the preservatives and additives that get added that keep it uh, for shelf life, that is actually what feeds the nutrients to the plant, and it's all force fed. That's my understanding of what I've read and stuff like that. Obviously, that's not anecdotal, you know, that because I've never done that. But that's why I think Synganix works is it's overfeeding and the plant just takes what it can. And that's actually from the preservatives and additives. It's not actually the nutrients that's in it. And I don't know about the nitrogen and calcium. As far as I know, calcium has to be delivered through the plant in the soil or through water because it's not mobile. So I don't actually know about that part. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. That's uh, kind of what, you know, what I was thinking about while he was, uh, mentioning all that mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Skruston, any thoughts on that? Any comments? Uh, so I don't think that I am, um, smart enough to have that type of, <laughs> I, uh, you know, conversation, but I will say that, um, in hydro, it felt like whatever whatever I ended up selecting was essentially whichever one, you know, ended up best, which that's normal. But in my soil runs while I'm, you know, sifting through packs of seeds, it's a lot easier for me to, even if I can't nail it, like nail a plant to really fucking perform best, I still get a much better baseline that I'm able to end up with, you know, a product at the end to decide on, Hey, this is that, you know, is this worth keeping moving forward and trying to like get it to its best? Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. I mean, I, I was thinking, right. Well, Bumcat was, kind of giving us a, a really nice account of like the various mechanisms that I guess there are a couple of different ways that someone could approach this. You could, you could, I imagine, uh, make changes purely based on all your observations, right? Without really knowing the theory, which is like, a, it's a process of like trial and error heuristics. Like you're basically just watching the plant and trying different things and seeing what it does. Right, which is a different way of looking at it. It's more of a like black box kind of approach. And maybe uh, come back to Bumcat. I'm curious, like when you when you were getting into this, like I imagine at times your experience and the theory, you know, wouldn't always be in step. Um, did you find that you had to do a lot of experimenting on your own um, outside of the theory to actually like refine your approach? Yeah, there was. Uh... I'm still experimenting to be completely honest with you. Um, every run, I always learn something new. Um, this plant never ceases to teach me something <laughs> that I thought I understood. Um, but yeah, this, my, my growing career has been a lot of trial and error and just trying different things and seeing how they react. Um, being forced into the two by four is really, f I kind of forced me into actually being able to understand and run through plants like the way that I wanted to, I needed to understand what was happening with the actual mechanisms. So I was forced into very much like reverting back to just the same books, going rereading the same passages over and over again, just to make sure that I fully understood the concept and that I didn't misread or misunderstand what they were actually trying to communicate. Um, same thing with the build a soil videos. It's, because organics tends to be in larger pots, 
it's been a constant, okay, what do I need to do to adjust for this? Is this, I know that like, for example, diesel plants are really heavy eaters. Um, I know that if I put a diesel in a one gallon pot, that's over eight inches. When I flip it to flour, it's probably going to end up close to three and a half, four feet. And it's going to be really, really hungry. So I know I, I need to feed a little bit more within my top dress or maybe add in even a second shot of like fish hydrolysate early on in flour to kind of alleviate the pressure on the media doing all the work. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a constant run of trial and error, little things here and there. Okay. Let's try feeding one plant the whole way through flour and see what happens with no flush. Uh, let's do one where they're going to get just water only. Let's do one where I'm going to do a little bit of pulse feeding with a top dress. Um, and it's, it, it really comes down to the individuals as well. Um, certain plants don't like certain things. Like um, I ran a Sensi Star Puck, uh, a couple of phenos of that. And one of them did not like anything to do with a mustard meal that I used in my top dress, which kind of catalyzes the microbial processes and um, within the top dress to break down a little bit faster. It made the soil a little hot and the roots freaked out and the plant just died. Like, and that was on day 23. Um, it's a constant trial and error of mm -hmm. new ideas. Like, okay, what about this? Um, let's try this here. It's just, it's constantly just, let's do little adjustments one at a time to see what happens and how the plant reacts. Yeah. And why I wanted to gesture towards this is because it, I think it highlights really well that despite there being a lot of theory and a lot of theory that one could go and consume, there's obviously going to be a limit um, to how much that can apply to your specific situation, your specific individual. And so, yeah, there's, there's a necessary limit to theory and how much it can do for you. And I just want to, you know, yeah, point that out. Yeah, you can absolutely, uh, so you can absolutely drown in the theory online. Yes. Um, there's everybody yes. has an opinion, and everybody thinks that their opinion is the most based in fact. Um, my biggest recommendation would be to check them against other sources. Do, do the little bit of extra work. Do that half hour of reading. It's really going to go a long way. It's going to save you a lot of mm -hmm. time and headache. Yeah, and I, I think about this uh, in. Wow not just in, in organic growing, but like in all facets of, of, of this plant, which is that um, you can't take theory for granted. There is no, there's not going to be any theory that's comprehensive enough to tell you everything you need to know about your, your plant. Like that's just not reality. And so there's always going to be some experimentation and experience necessary for you to, you know, really get, really get there. Kyle, did you want to say something about that? I was going to say a uh, Socratic heretic is like how I like to think of myself. I know enough to know that I don't really know anything, but I'm still going to kind of do my own thing. So that's what I just, that's how I always look at stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. Cause when, when Scruson was talking before, I mean, I think he's being really self-deprecating by saying he was smart enough, but I, for me, I think that the theory is really intimidating. Um, and so I can see why people would be like, look, I'm just going to work with what I have, see how it goes, you know, tweak it as, as it goes. And I'll keep an eye on the theory, but it's not going to like, yeah, fully inform slash overwhelm me. Um, yeah. yeah, just want to point that out. <laughs> in, in my opinion, honestly, the theory is a really good general guide. It's nothing that's going to work 100% of the time, all the time it's yeah you're still going to be going back and checking small things doing small differences that are going to be better suited for your needs at the time yeah and there's something else you mentioned earlier as well which is if you have the patience and time and effort to go and look at as many different perspectives as possible that would be very valuable because then you can at least compare and you can see where they overlap and where they don't and i'm sure that would be a lot more constructive than just like borrowing into one buying into like one single theory and like committing everything to that that single theory yeah all right i got another topic for us Go um on. pot size 
Uh, I heard Skirsten mention earlier that he does beds. Uh, I had a couple questions for him. What size beds are you running in the two by four? And uh, how often are you re-amending those? So I have been, uh, you know, attacked about it before, but I run two by four beds in my two by fours. Essentially the entire bottom is, uh, is soil. Um, and now I do take, uh, like my plastic solo cups that I use for, uh, for pots for seedlings and clones and stuff. Um, I have those pushed behind the bed so that it creates like a air gap there. So air can still be drawn through. Um, yeah, uh, I reamend them. When I flip, I usually add about a cubic foot of compost or casting, depending on, you know, if my, uh, if I have enough from my worm bins or anything like that. Um, when I don't, I usually just use, you know, like Malibu or Oli Mountain, either of those two, just because they're pretty solid and consistent. And I add some bat guano and some insect brass in that top dress. And then about two weeks later, I add... Uh, what's it called soft rock phosphate um, just to kind of essentially I'm giving what I, what I'm trying to do is give it just a base of, of food to eat. Um, and then depending on where I'm at in the cycle is what I'm adding dry amendments to kind of steer it a little bit uh, for down the road. <clears throat> Want to sit at the table with the syndicate? Check out our Patreon in our link tree or description below. Our merch site is officially live. We have all sorts of shirts, hoodies, and goodies to sort you out, and shipping is super fast, and most importantly, the quality is top notch. I've been saving old designs for years for this purpose, so please check it out, syndicategear.com. We also have an underground syndicate discord where we get together and solve old strain history together daily. It's an amazing community of learning away from IG, and it's an amazing resource for old catalogs and knowledge. We hope you join our union of breeders and growers. Come check it out.